Hi, my name is Jill Santiago. I am the director for the Center for Social Justice and Human Understanding, a nonprofit organization located at Suffolk County Community College. Today, I'm speaking with my friend and colleague, Christina Vargas, Chief Diversity Officer and Title IX Coordinator for the college, who also serves on the Board of Directors for Erase Racism, an organization which promotes racial equality in areas such as housing, education, and community development. Today's conversation focuses on systemic racism on Long Island and how it pervades nearly every area of life here. Christina, thank you for taking the time to sit down and have this conversation with me. So happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So we have known each other for a very long time as friends, as colleagues. We've um, grown up and lived in different communities, but we're in the same community now. And I think that anyone that knows you the way that I do knows that anti-racism is at the core of really everything that you do. And so I'm curious if you would share with us what motivated you to do this work and why it's personal to you. Thank you, Jill. I think you're 100% right. Um, it's part and parcel of who I feel like I am now, but it wasn't always that way. I think when we're growing up, we're not really conditioned to think about race and discrimination in an overt way. Um, but as I started having a family, and as I started thinking about where I wanted to raise my family, it became apparent that I wanted to be in a really diverse community. Um, my children are um, black and Latino, I'm Puerto Rican, and I wanted to make sure that I was kind of surrounding my kids with all different types of individuals who could help them grow and be great people. Um, and so um, through my job, I actually had the, the benefit of learning a lot about this work. Um, and I started to really get into doing training with individuals and thinking about how we could create more inclusive and equitable spaces for students, faculty, and staff. Um, so I've really had a privilege of getting to know many people who are willing to share their experiences with us. And um, it's become a passion of mine to really think about this in an intentional way when it comes to educating people about issues of race. Yeah, and it's just clear that it's not, it's just not work to you. It, it's really about your, your morals and the values and what you want to see in the communities that we, that we live in. So unfortunately, we know that racism is embedded in the very fabric of Long Island history. Um, in fact, you could say it's actually by design. So what I want to do before we get started is just define what is systemic racism. So it's interesting because I think when people think about racism, they automatically think about prejudice, bias, bigotry, and acts of kind of intolerance and not wanting to understand other people and really, you know, very harsh, uh, difficult situations and sometimes some subtle situations, right? Mm. But what we're really not talking about when we talk about systemic racism are individual acts of aggression. We're really talking about policies, practices, and systems that disenfranchise certain groups of people, usually black and brown people, and advantage other groups of people, usually white and Caucasian people. And it's usually not always at the surface, right? It mm -hmm. seems like it's just something that happens um, as an individual situation, but then when you look back at patterns and practices and rules and policies and laws, you see that they have a dis disproportionate impact on certain communities. So you're saying really it, this is not about micro level acts, this is really about the much bigger picture and how it plays out in these various systems that are, have been in some cases created yeah, I mean, yeah, if you think about it, right, a lot of folks talk about, I want to treat people equally. That's true. Mm -hmm. Like, nobody wants to be treating people in an unfair way. I think most people want to be treated fairly, equally, and justly. I think the issue becomes when there are things that are operating underneath the surface that we don't even see. Uh, the visuals that we receive on the news, for example, the information that we see in terms of where people live on Long Island, um, the way that communities engage with each other or don't engage with each other that all ends up becoming something that's a broader practice and pattern that we pay attention to when it comes to issues of race. So it's interesting because in the book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, the author gets into this idea about if you call a white person racist, how highly offensive that is. 
but could you speak to that a little bit about how the individual is not necessarily racist, but how that individual still benefits from the system? So Can you I, speak to that? Yeah, sure. Um, I think for me, this is, this is always very hard because I think people are truly well-intentioned mm -hmm. in 99% of the cases. People Absolutely. are wanting to be fair. They want to be, um, remove themselves of all the stereotypes that they've learned. They don't want to misspeak or say anything that seems offensive or mm -hmm. inappropriate. But then, when you look at the experiences that they have, they're markedly different than experiences from other people. So let me give you an example. Um, my experience when I became a mom of shopping in exclusive retail stores, right? So before I had a child, if I went into a store, it was a good chance I might not ask, be asked immediately if I needed help. They kind of assumed that I probably couldn't afford to shop in that store. Mm. Maybe they didn't necessarily help me. Then I would show up with my baby carriage and as a mom with, you know, and, and all of a sudden it kind of changed like, oh, maybe she's a bit, maybe she actually can be in this store. She's, she's clearly a stable mom, right? She can actually right. engage in this work. I don't think that store clerk who didn't take care of me made an overt assumption. If I said, hey, did you not come over to me because I'm a person of color? They would look at me like I had three heads. Mm -hmm. They would say, no, that's not it. <laughs> you right. know, that's not right. what we're talking about. But I would actually say that I've had that experience happen so many times that at some point I have to point to what, what is the reason behind that? And it is, it, is it because of exposure? Is it because that folks have a stereotypical understanding of what they think someone should, where somebody belongs and what they think somebody is available and able to do, for and example. And you can identify a pattern of, Correct. Of, of this type of behavior, reactions, responses to certain individuals. And I think people tend to ignore those patterns, right? They mm. want to believe that those patterns aren't real and that's not my lived experience. So when I confront somebody and I say, hey, not in a negative way, not confront, I'm not confrontational to, be conf like to have conflict, but just mm -hmm. to say, hey, can I point something out to you? can I share that this happens to me pretty often? Folks are pretty surprised. They're like, mm. what do you mean that happens mm. to you pretty often? Really? That's really what your experience is? Are you sure? Mm. And that questioning comes from the fact that folks haven't had that experience in their own life. Yeah. And yeah. so we just have to understand that people have very different ways of approaching and thinking about what their experiences are. Absolutely. So as I mentioned before, racism is woven into, you know, into the fabric of our communities and what they look like. Suffolk remains in the top 10 most segregated counties in the nation. In fact, of 291 communities on Long Island, most black residents live in just 11. And Smithtown is the most segregated town in the state. Can we talk about why? Why do our communities look like this? So it's, there's a long history of how housing patterns developed in the suburbs and in particularly on Long Island. Um, if you look at the post-World War II era where veterans came home and were given opportunity for housing subsidies and vouchers, mm -hmm. it's kind of well documented that most of the housing subsidies and vouchers that went to African-American and Latino families ended up in public housing, in high-rise housing, concentrated in the major cities, and in New York City, in particular. Mm -hmm. um, GIs who came home who were white were also given kind of housing vouchers through the Federal Housing Administration and FHA loans, mortgages that allowed them to purchase homes. Um, and those homes, you know, created the suburbs on Long Island. Mm -hmm. uh, the most famous first suburb being Levittown. Um, and Levittown is well known and has sh this, this actual documentation and proof now that there were racial covenants about who could buy those homes. So it was literally written into law that African-American and black people could not buy those homes. And Levittown was actually called, referred to as a sundown town, mm -hmm. right? Where black people were warned you should not be there after sundown. Yeah, and, and I hate to say it wasn't just on Long Island. I mean, even in mm -hmm. my experience in growing up in New York City, there were certain parts of New York City that I grew up in knowing that you really shouldn't be there unless you know someone. Mm. <laughs> you shouldn't be there unless you know someone you can visit. Um, so anyhow, back to Long Island. What mm -hmm. I'll say is that over the generations now of people who um, have purchased homes over the years, you know, you'll notice where is their rental communities versus homeowning communities. You can notice um, where real estate agents take individuals to look for homes and what they ask as they're trying to decide to offer people an opportunity 
to, to check out what they want to purchase as a home. And that process is actually something that is um, now been proven to be kind of overtly discriminatory. Right. Um, if you were the person on the receiving end of that, that real estate agent's recommendation, you would never know it. Like they're talking to you in a friendly way. Uh, the Newsday um, series that actually proved this point um, had individuals who were from both races who asked very similar questions with similar backgrounds. These, these housing testers were actually taken to real, you know, asking real estate agents to take them to see specific communities. And in some cases, they were either discouraged from showing those communities or they were just offered different homes that were for sale that weren't in the communities that weren't racially aligned with who they were. Right. So going back to what you were saying about these high rise communities, what, what was the history there? How did, that, how did that play out? Well, again, disproportionate numbers of African American and Latino people moved into those housing um, communities. As a result, you know, they didn't have home ownership, right? And they were rentals for many years. In some cases, you know, there was kind of sustained poverty in those communities. Um, and as a result, those individuals didn't kind of amass the wealth over generations that could allow someone who has a home to kind of leave it to their children, have an opportunity for additional wealth in your family through generations. Right, because that's where most people's, that's most people's greatest asset really, right? Correct, right. right. So given the statistics of segregation as they relate to Long Island, as well as what you've just shared, it shouldn't come as any great surprise that our schools are also very segregated. Could you talk about the effect that that has on our children and the broader community? Yeah, I, I, it's interesting because that's kind of how I got, became more aware of what these issues were when I was a, searching for a home and in which community I was going to live. Again, I, I, wanted to, I had a three-year-old son and I knew he'd be starting kindergarten in a couple of years. And I wanted to make sure that he would have a diverse environment where he could see lots of different individuals and um, be exposed to lots of different ideas and cultures. Uh, and it was a difficult task. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it's incredibly difficult. It's a difficult task. And so um, what I'll say to you is there are a lot of students um, who right now are in schools on Long Island who don't see anyone different than themselves racially mm -hmm. and culturally. And so you'll see some communities and schools where they're not seeing or being exposed to people who are different than them, but really underneath we're all same, the same, right, in terms of mm -hmm. being human. Sure. Um, so for the first time that they're exposed to diversity, they might be here at the college. Right? Which they is might, incredible to think about. Yeah, exactly. And if you look at the number of school districts we have, they're actually designed to create um, little boxes of keeping communities um, divided based on these characteristics, both income and race. Um, so if you look side by side, you mentioned Smithtown, you know, there, there are 124 or 127 school districts on Long Island in Nassau and Suffolk County. That's many, many different ways that, that communities are divided where you can't go to a school that's outside of your community, right? And I think even the mindset in a lot of the schools are very similar. So it's not just about the way that we look, it's also about attitudes and, and it goes beyond mm -hmm. just how a person looks. But it's incredible to think about our students here at Suffolk sitting down in my Western Civ class and the first time looking around the classroom and seeing people that that look different than them. It's yeah. astounding. Uh, you know, it's interesting because I feel very fortunate that I feel like in our school district where we live, there's a, a lot more diversity amongst the student body. Yes. But the communities are still very, very interestingly organized. Right? Yeah, so the district, <laughs> in, the, in the school district, you can see a little bit of everything. Right. But the communities, the, the, the different populations are centered in different, Correct. different areas. Correct, exactly. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. So because racism has been built into the foundation of Long Island and our communities look the way they do, access to resource varies by community. What one resident of Suffolk County has access to may be very different from a person who lives just a few miles away. Can you provide some insight on the impact that has on individuals? Banks, supermarkets, for example, things right. like that. So if you look, um in different communities on Long Island, you might find that certain banks, certain stores are located in certain communities, right? And so, for example, 
Um, I was thinking the other day I needed to stop at the bank. Rarely that you have to go to a bank, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It's rare that you even, but I just had to even use the ATM. Uh, and I realized that in my neighborhood, over the years, every single bank has closed. Hmm. And I had to drive to a neighboring community to go to the, the bank that would potentially not charge me an extra fee to use an ATM. So if I wanted to use an ATM in my community, the closest ATM would be like in a 7-Eleven, which charges like four or five dollars to take mm -hmm. out your money, right? So all those little things add up instead of me being able to go to the branch that's nearby for me to actually access my funds. Um, the kinds of services that you see, the types of communities um, that are focused on or that people invest in um, can really impact that work. So the property tax bases, um, from housing and from retail spaces impact the educational spaces because uh, you know the school district is impacted by the amount of property taxes we collect right. the value of the homes impacts those spaces and so I think the goal is to try to think about equity for all individuals who can have access to the services that they're entitled to and I mean those are those are some great examples but just going back even to the ATM fees and not having a bank mm -hmm. near your home mm -hmm. four or five dollars that 7-eleven ATM machine is charging you plus your own bank's fees for some people that's a that's a significant amount of money for them right? absolutely I mean if you're looking at the needs especially now where people have had high unemployment because of COVID sure. um, where people are, people want to live in a community where they can see and ex, uh, receive everything that they deserve to live in. They don't want to have to be inconvenienced to drive further in order to um, just do a transaction that well, anybody this, this can is do. The thing. I mean, these are everyday things that we all have to do, and not having, you know, uh, equal access is is a, is a problem here. As we're talking today, we're finally starting to see life reemerge as we come out of the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has made an incalculable number of changes to our world, but it also highlighted the gross injustice and systemic racism, the very real impact that it has on healthcare, and frankly, who lives and dies. Can you talk about how we saw the interplay between the pandemic and systemic racism here in Suffolk County and beyond? It's so tragic. <laughs> it's just unbelievably tragic. When you look at the Suffolk County COVID tracker, the beautiful news is they've been able to disaggregate all the data by community. And if you look at the graph and the spike of cases in certain communities that are predominantly African-American and or Latino, where we see, one, lots of folks who were required to work during the pandemic because mm -hmm. they were um, essential workers. Um, two, who may not have done the, um, who may not have had access to health care in the ways that we would hope because, one, there's, a, there's kind of a lack of access to the health care system. There's a lack of access to insurance and kinds of jobs that actually give you health insurance. Mm. Um, and those essential workers, you know, we're at the front lines being infected and seeing very tragic results, right? Um, in addition to that, if you think about people's trust of the healthcare system itself yes. and how people are treated when they go to the emergency room and how people have been treated historically in the past if they call the ambulance and the EMT and how they're, what questions they're asked or not asked about their health or a fear of just the healthcare system in itself because of maybe they were stereotyped or there was some overt discrimination against them. Folks were really reluctant to mm -hmm. even access services. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, I can personally say I know a number of people who were impacted and who passed away as a result of having, you know, tragic circumstances because they were not really well in the first place, right? They started off with underlying conditions, pre-existing conditions, a lack of access to healthcare, and now you add a pandemic. And unfortunately, um, those particular conditions can really exacerbate, you know, the, the incidents that can happen related to their health and, their, and sadly, you know, their success in fighting the virus. Yeah, we even saw it play out in, in the school system, right? Like how the pandemic impacted students who were going to be now learning remotely, who might not have had internet access, computers, and the support that they needed at home. Yeah, if you look at the needs in some of the most high needs school districts, right? The second that, think about it, back in March of 2020, schools abruptly stopped mm -hmm. coming in person. So 
how are you going to get access to a laptop? If you have siblings in your um, home, how are you going to share a laptop mm -hmm. to take classes at the same time? If you normally have multiple ages in a household, they're each in a different school or in a different classroom, so how are you sharing one computer to do your work? And in some cases, there were many, many efforts to try to distribute equipment, to try to provide support, um, to try to help students who had needs continue to accomplish the work. But there's so many students who've kind of dropped out of the system as a result of just not having access to the resources that we need in terms of technology. And other, other things that the school district provides, right? If a, if a student depends on school lunch and other, other supports like that, that they were missing out as well. And you saw that all play out because of where you live. Absolutely. <clears throat> You have shared so much knowledge and insight here today, and this conversation is so valuable for students of Suffolk County. Once a student absorbs some of what you have shared today, what can they do? What action can they take? So first, I think it's really important to just acknowledge and notice things that are happening in your community and what's around you. I think you have to have some trusting um, conversations with people that you know and to try to think about listening to their experiences to have a little more empathy for certain, certain circumstances, right? So for mm. me, I feel really fortunate my children are grown now. I didn't have the same struggles with homeschool that other people have had as your example. Right. It's important that I listen to my friends and colleagues who have had that experience and really try to relate to what they're doing. So in your own examples, as students, Think beyond your own experience. Try to engage with other people to learn from them. That's really like an important first step. Mm. Um, then, if you're really interested in diving deeper, there are lots of local organizations. There are lots of internal resources here at the college that can help you, one, you know, learn more, and two, advocate if you'd like to be engaged with your communities. Vote, right? Vote in your local vote, school district vote, elections. Um, make sure that you're involved with going to programs to learn more about these issues. And if you want to advocate around these issues, get involved, like join a student group that's going to potentially engage with this work. Um, in your own hometown, think about what you can do to try to be engaged with helping understand the things that impact your own community. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for sitting down with me today, for your passion, and for all of the ways that you're working to educate and change our communities for the better. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.